and we walked step by step and you had to look at each one of the stones you stepped on lest you go over the cliff and that was a fact and as we're going through second timothy i'm finding myself doing just that very thing going step by step not wanting to miss one little step, one little beautiful nugget, one little picture. And today is no different. Today's thought is all about God's inspired word. All scripture in chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God. That's our verse. I'm going to read for you first um, our text. Uh, and leading up to that, that's going to be 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and, ha and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every work. All scripture is inspired by God. And that's what I wanted to talk with you this morning about. How God's word came from somewhere. It wasn't something that man developed. It wasn't something that was thought about by a group of guys, by 12 disciples who decided, well, this is a good idea. Let's just put all this together. Or someone that had thought in some time period, well, we're going to go and grab all of these different thoughts from all over the world and bring them together and make a religion out of it or something like that. But all scripture is breathed out, literally, the word inspired there is breathed out. In fact, that whole piece that we just read is actually one word and it describes God breathing out his word. Now in 1953, a couple of incredible things happened. First, Chevy made an awesome car. No, they did. 1953 Chevy, awesome car. But also Queen Elizabeth became the queen of England. And when she was being brought into um, this office of being the queen, there was an ordination that went on and uh, that happened in June of 1953. And as, as she entered into the church, um, the Westminster Church, um, they read Psalm 2122 and actually through the entire coordination, they read scripture. But what I wanted to read for you is what what they, what they asked Queen Elizabeth, um, like she was getting married, she'd have to say, I do, after each one of these things. I will, I do. She had to take this oath. And it's a really interesting deal. You can go read yourself later on. You can find it on, on, um, on the internet. But what, she, what they had asked her, what the Archbishop um, had asked her of uh, the Church of Scotland um, had said this. Our gracious queen, um, and he's handing her a Bible as he's saying this, okay? To keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the, this Bible, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that the world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. There are, these are the lively oracles of God. How many people today, how many people in Great Britain, in the UK, are, are seeing this like that still? Even in 1953, uh, if you watched The Crown on Netflix, anybody see that? If you got Netflix, go watch it. It's really incredible the crown you watch that not everybody that was in the in the, in the uh not the oval office what are they in the in the castle was believing god they weren't living right they weren't this was the lifeline to the country and as this went so did the country that's what they really truly believed now when paul 
when Paul the, the apostle had, um, had an encounter with Christ before that took place, he had been studying God's word. He had taken God's word and placed it inside of his heart and was, was uh, not only knowing what the Bible was saying, the Old Testament, he was understanding it too, but he was missing something, you see. He was missing the one that it was pointing to. He, he had knowledge of the Bible, of the Old Testament. He understood it, but he did not grasp the person that it was talking about. Um, when Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7 that he had finished his race, he was speaking of the race he was running to not only know the Bible, not only to understand the scripture, but to have an encounter with the one it was pointing to. That was the race he was running. And for the Apostle Paul, that specific race was to go and share the gospel with other people, to preach and teach what he had as a pastor, to raise up other men as pastors. Now the race that you have to run is no different. You're not, you, know, you, you might not be a pastor, but God has given you his word. He's given you his word to understand. He's given you his word to know. But more importantly than that, he has given you his spirit living inside of you so you can know the one that the word is pointing to, which Paul was missing. If you remember when he was on the road to Emmaus, he said, who are you, Lord? And what did Jesus say? Paul, you're the one that's persecuting me. And he goes, what? That can't be true. He knew that all of what he knew out of the word, out of the Old Testament, that this is who was talking to him, he knew right there. And all that he wanted to do was now run this race. Now, Paul could have run this race in a different way. At the end of, of his life, in, in, in chapter 4, we're going to get into that pretty soon, he said, I ran my race. I didn't stop. I kept on going and going and going and going. And, and the comfort I'm sure that Paul had was that the only thing that held him back from doing more was the frailty of his own body, that he couldn't physically go do anything else. He pushed himself to the very, very limit. Now, Paul didn't have to do that. He could have taken God's word and he could have gotten himself all kinds of medals for what he knew. He could have. He was very, very smart. He could have run the race and had gotten himself a beautiful wreath like in the, the Olympic Games. People would say, oh, Paul, the great teacher. He might have had great power. He could have done that. He could have had comfort in his old age too. He could have not done what he did. What did, he, what, what did he do? What was his old age like? Remember, he was in a dingy, dark, disgusting dungeon. Rats and no food and cold. That's where this race ended up. And he didn't have to be there. He didn't have to go there. But Paul could not have done anything else. Paul chose to run this race that Jesus gave him. In Acts 9.15, the Bible says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Ananias, no, not Ananias, but go and tell Paul this, that Paul is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That was the race, to go out and tell everybody everybody, everybody about who this God is, who Jesus Christ is. Now, it's hard to imagine, you see, it's hard to imagine today. It's hard to, to imagine how many people are going, um, going, into, um, going into this race, running this race without having an encounter with Jesus. How, how do you do that? How can you go and run this race and, and 
all you have is, is, the, is the degree, you might say. You might have the knowledge of who God is. You might have understanding of who God is. But you never had an encounter with him. And you're running this race, you see. And if that is what's taking place, the inspired scripture that has been breathed out by God isn't what you believe. You don't believe that. You start taking stuff out is what happens. You start to say, well, well, Paul, Paul really, he, what he said there wasn't inspired and over here, this was inspired and, uh, and this one's difficult. So we don't, we just kind of skip over that one, but we love to have this one. And, and that scripture over there was for that time period and it means nothing to us. But what Paul said here was that all scripture is God breathed. All of the Bible is literally breathed out by God. This race that Paul was running looked like this. When he had received food after Paul had taken uh, uh, taken his um, his uh, his, eye, his eyesight now was was given to him. He had he had he had taken his humble pie, <laughs> really. He had knocked off his horse, blinded. Uh, this Gentile guy comes along and prays for him. Pretty humbling. When Paul had received food, this is the first thing he did. Check it out. He was strengthened. Then Saul, who is Paul, went some days with the disciples to Damascus. Immediately, didn't wait. He's going to run the race. And this race, you see, is going to get him in trouble. Watch, he preached the Christ in the synagogues. Uh-oh that he is the son of God. What was he preaching with? The inspired word that he said in, in 2 Timothy. All of it is inspired by God. He went into the synagogues and preached the son of God, Jesus Christ. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who tried to destroy uh, all the Christians in, uh, in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose maybe so that he might bring them bound by the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. How did he prove that? He proved that by not only knowing God's word, by studying it, not just by, by understanding it, which is really what preaching is about. Preaching is, see, teaching is me teaching you the stuff, right? You're getting information. But preaching is application, it's emotion, it's the application of it, so you really get it. And Paul was doing both of those things after he had the encounter with Jesus. It all pointed towards Jesus. All of the scriptures were pointing towards him. As he was preaching, it was always pointing towards him. And Jesus was the one that had inspired it all. All of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament scriptures. He kept on preaching and teaching. And in verse 29 of, of chapter 9 of Acts, and he boldly, he spoke boldly in the name of the, Lord, of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, which were the people that just absolutely hated Christians. And Paul was right alongside them. He said, Paul, he's going with the Hellenists. Paul, you know, we were like always having them agape meal barbecues at you with the beach, man. And it was really great. But now you have lost it. What's wrong with you? He says, well, here it is. Do you believe the scriptures? Well, of course we do. Do you understand the scriptures? Well, yeah, as much as you do. But have you encountered the one that you know and understand? And they, what they do? They tried to kill him. They tried to kill him over that, you see. He kept on preaching and teaching the Holy Scriptures. Preaching, teaching the Holy Scriptures. In verse 1 of chapter 11, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. How did that happen? People that did not know God at all. That was a fulfillment. That was, that was Paul's race he was running. Do you see what is, what is the... The, what do you call it? The uh, silver thread woven through the fabric or the 
The what? The silver lining. Silver lining. You see the thread uh, woven through all of this, which is the word. Every bit of it. The word of God is going and holding it all, woven through it, up and down, all around it, holding it all together. And if you don't know the scriptures, understand the scriptures, and have an encounter with the one that they're talking about, then you will not be equipped. You won't be fully equipped, which is what Paul is, is going to be saying to us in, uh, in 2 Timothy. Paul's race was completely wrapped, completely wrapped around Jesus. So, Paul is totally convinced, 100%, that God's word is breathed out by God, or he would not have run this race like that. He would never have done it if he really didn't believe it. So the question today that's, that's just going to be asked of us is, what do you believe about God's word? What do you really believe about this? It is not what you were taught about this. It's not what you understand about this. But what encounter have you had with this? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Um, and, uh, and so Paul said to Timothy in verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of. You got to continue in those things, knowing from whom you've learned them, that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which is what Paul was teaching. That from childhood you've known them, and they're able to make you wise unto salvation. Paul said that this leads you to having faith in Christ. You have been given this beautiful gift of knowing the word of understanding the word, and now having had an encounter with the one that they're speaking of. Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures, and Paul says that these Holy Scriptures are the very ones that Jesus taught out of. The very Scriptures that are being, being used in, in, in Paul's life when he came to faith, when all the scriptures that he had been learning were the very ones that Jesus himself were learning. In fact, Jesus had gone up against these religious leaders in John chapter 5, and he said, and, and the Father himself, Jesus said, has sent me to testify of me. The Father has done that. You have, ne you have neither heard the Father's voice at any time, nor have you ever seen him. But you do not have his word abiding inside of you. Because whom he sent, him you did not believe. You know the scriptures, Jesus is saying. You understand them, but you do not see who this is pointing to, which is me. You don't see it. You search the scriptures for them. You think you have eternal life because you know and you understand this. Yeah, but you don't know me. You think you have eternal life and these which they are testify of me and you're rejecting me. Literally, you are rejecting this. You're rejecting the holy scriptures. And Paul says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. First, he said that the holy scriptures, from childhood you've known the holy scriptures, now he is shifting a little bit of a gear here. And he's saying to Timothy in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul is enforcing that not only is the Bible, the Bible is, is, is the, that, that God is the only source of the holy scriptures, that the Bible is a source of everything that is necessary for a godly life without it. Without the Holy Scriptures, and now he's going to be shifting here to, to talk with Timothy about something, that these scriptures that are given by inspiration, by breathing, by the breath of God, it'd be like a pastor, it'd be like a sailor going out on the ocean with a sailboat and leaving all of his rigging at home. Now the rigging are the ropes, the pulleys, 
the fasteners, everything that keeps the sail where it's supposed to be is all the rigging. So you can have the sail beautiful. Do you know what a sailboat looks like without the rigging? The sail wiggles around like a worm. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't push the boat at all. This rigging is knowing God. It's what the pastor needs. If a pastor does not believe that this is the inspired word of God, as he's teaching, as he's reading at home now, he's saying, ah, that ain't true. Do you know what that does in his preaching? It comes right out in his preaching. It comes right out as something that just the, the fire that's inside of him, the, the, you know when someone's lying, don't you? Don't you feel it? You know that what he's saying, he doesn't really believe it. You know, ask somebody that really does not believe that Donald Trump should be a president, though he says that, it, that, the, that he should. You can tell if someone doesn't like Don, President Trump. <laughs> you can tell. You don't even have to ask, right? And you can really tell if a pastor is really, really convinced, like that Baptist preacher we had in here last month. Remember him? Now, couldn't you, just, couldn't you just feel that that man was totally, totally convinced that this is the word of God? You didn't even have to ask. Do you know why that man preached behind this pulpit? Because that's what he believed. And I wouldn't have anybody behind this pulpit that does not believe that. I flat out asked him, what's the gospel? <laughs> I mean, he laid it right on me. I said, that's good. Right on. So what is a false gospel then, sir? And he laid it on me. And what is the word of God? And he laid it on me. And when he preached, he preached in power. He did. And it was awesome. I love to watch, him, watch a preacher preach. Now he's, he's going to... Uh, now, if, um, if a preacher now is, uh, is not believing all of this, and as he's teaching, do you, you realize that Paul said to Timothy that within the Holy Scriptures is salvation. Within this, within the Holy Scriptures, is salvation by faith in Christ. You're saved by knowing this. You're saved. So consequently, what does that mean when, when a preacher is coming up here and, and doesn't believe all of this? There is no salvation in his, in his voice. He's not talking about the gospel anymore. There is no correction, correction of sin. There is no correction there. There is no instruction on how to live right. There is no reproof on bad behavior. It isn't there. There is no equipping for every good work. It's not there. So if anybody ever, listen, if anybody ever comes up to you and says uh, something like, I don't like Pastor Adam because he's always meddling in my life. Somebody says that to you. Say, well, look, you're mad at the wrong person. You got a beef, go to Jesus. Go yell at him. Because all Pastor Adam is doing is just preaching Jesus to get off his back and you know, put it where it belongs. Are you mad at Jesus? Go yell at him. He can handle it. I'd never yell at Jesus, you know. Well, you actually are. You're going up against him. That's what the word does, isn't it? Doesn't the Bible bring you to salvation? Doesn't the word of God correct you? Doesn't it bring instruction for you how you're supposed to live? Doesn't it reprove your bad behavior? Doesn't the word of God do that as you're reading it and as you're, as you're studying it and then you're encountering Jesus? Now, don't you ever feel that? When you're reading the word of God and Jesus himself is saying, you know, I don't want you doing that anymore. As you're reading the word, he's the one telling you that. Has that ever happened to you? When, you're, when that happens, isn't there going to be some change and equipping for every good work? Absolutely. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it all. All scripture is inspired by God. We need to know that this is completely God's word, 100%. All scripture, every bit of it. Now, when, when Paul shifts gear, gears here and says all scripture first he said he said that the holy scriptures are able to, to save you and then he says it again in a different way that all scripture is inspired by god he's referring to his own writings and not only his writings 
but, but Peter and James and Mark and John and Luke and all them guys. Holy scriptures. Now the, the question there, not, and, and this is, this is why, we, this is why, it, it, this is, you know, you're saying, oh, pastor, you're just kind of saying that, right? Well, and Peter said it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our brother, uh, beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. We're talking about Paul's writing here. As also in all his epistles, not just the one, speaking in them these things in which you are, uh, that some things are hard to get, hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do all the rest of the scriptures. All scripture is inspired by God. Right there, the Apostle Peter is saying that the writings of Apostle, the Apostle Paul are inspired scripture. So the question there, here's the big question. What does that look like? You ever ask it? I mean, did, did, did Paul sit and he's, he gets himself into a trance or something? Was it that he had a, a golden pen that all he had to do was get the golden pen and dip it into the golden oil well, inkwell. And then all of a sudden he would just like write it down and not really know what he was writing. Is that what it was? Sound familiar? The guy that started the Mormon church, that's how it started. He had his special golden glasses, you know? <laughs> you know that? And he's like, those are heretics, man. That guy is a false teacher. It wasn't like that at all. In fact, there is something that, um, that theologians call the dual authorship of Scripture. And this is it. This is where it's at. The dual authorship of Scripture. Are you cold? I have that down too low, I think. You can turn up the AC. I think I have it on 72, sorry. I think it needs to be warm. Is anybody else cold in here? We all good? If you get cold, turn it, turn it up a little bit. It's fine. The dual authorship of Scripture goes like this, that, that this book, 2 Timothy, the Scripture that we have here, the Holy Scripture that was inspired by God was written 100% by Paul with his own experience just writing it and 100% breathed out by God. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Because it needs to be either or. God did not inspire Inspire Paul to write this. God breathed on what was written by Paul. You see? As the life of God was inside of him and what he saw, God then inspired the words. He didn't inspire the writer, he inspired the words. Now, there's a place we can go to that really proves this one too. And this whole thing we're talking about really needs to be proved out of scripture or it just becomes another one of those things that everybody talks about. Oh, that sounded really cool, Pastor Adam. That was really wild and you go home. But unless it's based out of scripture, it means nothing. And we can't really grab onto it. Now, where in the Bible is this, is this going to be developed? In Luke's gospel, chapter one, Luke Luke tells us exactly why he wrote the book of Luke. Luke was written after the book of Mark and, uh, and the book of Matthew. The book of John was written after Luke. And a good 60% of what is in the book of Luke is in the book of Mark. Taken right out of it. This is interesting. So here is the beginning of the book of Luke and this whole first four verses is written in a different style, actually. And I don't know Greek and all that. I, would, I just read this, this week, in fact. That this whole area there is written in a different style than the rest of the entire book. So Luke is trying to get the point here 
why he wrote this book, why. He said in, uh, in Luke chapter one, verse one, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. A lot of people have been writing about Jesus, lots. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. We're all getting this, you see. In every church, they were getting these little bits and pieces from the disciples and they were reading them and they were studying them and they saw them as scripture. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I have, I have decided, I also have decided. Who decided? Timothy did. I mean, Luke did. Luke decided to write this. He decided to write this to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Now, who Theophilus is, is um, not known. I looked all over the place trying to figure out who is this Theophilus guy. One commentator, interestingly, had said that this may have been the guy that was, uh, was uh, trying Paul's case in Rome, Theophilus. And Luke had written this to be sent to Rome so they would know what Paul was talking about. So what he did was Luke went around and got all the information from everywhere. He wasn't there. So he, when he, he talked to this person. He talked to that person. He talked to Mark. He talked to the eyewitness accounts. And he took all the information and he put it all together in this letter and sent it off to Theophilus. That was 100% Luke, but 100% breathed upon by God, which, cre which made it scripture, which made this holy scripture, this book, is God breathed. The source of this book is from God. This is the greatest authority in all the world. The entrance of this book into the world brings light and life. There have been no more printed books greater than this. Five billion of them they have on record. Five billion. Um, the Quran is like a close, not even a close second at 800 million. Five billion of these. There's no other book on the planet that's been printed like this. The Bible has been written over a 1600 year period. It wasn't one time, 1600 years, yet it interestingly has one mind. Why? Because it's all been inspired. It's been breathed on by each one of the writers and their experience. That's why when you read in, in, uh, in the book of Exodus and you read those things, when you read all the accounts and, and the Psalms and you read First and Second Samuel, you're actually reading history. You're reading someone's account and God breathed upon it and it had become then holy scripture. More than 40 authors are found in this book and 66 different books are inside here. Um, they were, this was written on three different continents, yet it all has the same mind. You ever play that game telephone before? Anybody ever play the game telephone? Mary Ellen, you ever play the game telephone, Lance? You play the game telephone? No, the game telephone goes like this. Uh, we all get into a line, okay? And then I tell George, um, I tell George something. I say something like, um, while I was going down Duval, I saw a pink elephant flying over the road. And he said, good morning, sir. How are you? Okay, now, George repeats what I just said. And the more people you got, the funner it is. Because then... That person will then, and it's best to write it down so you can see it exactly. That person will say what it is they heard and then you read what you said. And it's always totally different. Always. 
The game telephone is a good proof text that this is the inspired word of God because all of this could not have been so wove together in one mind. It'd be like all those people coming back around and saying the exact same thing back to me. It, this was written in three different languages too. Now, tons of different subjects that are very, very t controversial. God gave us his word. He gave us his word simply so that we could be saved. We could be saved from our sin, yes. That you would know salvation in Christ, yes. If he did not give us this book, if he did not give us his inspired word, we would not know about what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. We wouldn't know it. But it isn't just eternal salvation. No, it's not just salvation there. But if you remember, when Adam and Eve, remember? When Adam and Eve were given one instruction, a word from God, remember what it was? Don't eat the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave Adam his word. Adam then gave Eve God's word and he didn't give it to her. And when he gave it to her, what did Eve do to it? She added to it. That was not inspired. She said to the devil, oh, the Lord didn't say that we can't touch it because the devil said, did God say that you can't touch that tree? I mean, did God say that you, you, that you can't eat of that tree? You're going to die if you eat of that tree. And she said, yeah, he said that if, that if we eat it or even touch it, we're dead. He didn't say that. He didn't say you couldn't make a table out of it. He said you couldn't, can't burn it. He said you can't feed it to your animals. He said you, you don't eat it. So the attack then was on God's word. And what happened when God's word then was not followed? Sin took place. And what happened to Adam and Eve? Separation from God. That's, that's it. And if God had not inspired his word, we would not know that sin separates us from God. As we're reading God's word, God then speaks to us. As we're reading his inspired word and we're, we're knowing it, we're understanding it, but, oh, don't miss this. Don't miss this. It isn't just knowing the word. It's not just understanding it, but having an encounter with the one that the word is pointing to. Because when you have an encounter with him and the Lord goes up to you, like he did the woman caught in adultery, remember what he said to her? Where are your accusers now? Nowhere, Lord. And what did Jesus say? Your sin is forgiven you. Don't go do that anymore. That's salvation. Where did we learn that from? His holy word. We learn it from here. Romans chapter 10 says this. But how shall they ask him to ask him to save them? How shall they ask him to save them? unless they believe in him. How are they going to know? Unless they have the word there. They can't. How can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? They can't. And how can they hear about him unless someone goes and tells them? They can't. It's all verbal. It's all with words. This is verbal. God's talking to you verbally. His breath. Adam, pa, pa. My breath is talking to you, right? God's talking to you from his breath. And he's saying, I need to use your breath to go and talk to people about me. But you've got to have an encounter with me. It can't just be knowledge, understanding of the word. You've got to have an encounter with the breath. And once you do, do this. And how will anyone go and tell them unless someone sends him? This is what the scriptures are talking about when they say how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace with God and bring glad tidings of good news. In other words, how welcome are those who preach the good news? Are you convinced of this? Are you 100% convinced without a doubt that this book 
is an inspired breath of God. Are you 100% convinced, what? That God wrote a book. Not a man, but God wrote a book. And that he's talking to you when you read it. Are you convinced of that? If you are, then there is no problem with you going to your neighbor and talking to him. You know why? Because your neighbor loves you a little bit. <laughs> right? They love you enough where you can go talk to them. Really. It's real different than going down this street where nobody knows you. But your neighbor at least knows you. And when you're convinced, especially when you bring them cookies this Christmas, or whatever you want to bring them, fish tacos. Hey, I got some fish tacos for you, man. Yeah. What do you want? Nothing. <laughs> I love you. And you can talk to them but you know what? You'll only talk to them about something you're totally convinced of. If you're not, your neighbors are going to say, yeah, you really don't believe that. Yeah, it ain't, alive, it ain't alive inside of you. And look, if this is not totally convincing to you, my prayer is that you would be convinced. You would be convinced that this is God's word. If, if, you, if you know Christ, if you know him from his word and you understand what it's saying, but you've never had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus before and you, and you don't know his, his life inside of you, I, my, my prayer is that you would not leave here until that is settled inside of your heart. If today you believe this and you understand that this is the word of God, and you've had an encounter with Jesus, my prayer then is for you that you go and tell somebody about it. Because there's nothing like going and telling somebody that you're in love that makes it just even more fabulous. When you go in and tell everybody that you're in love, when you go tell somebody about Jesus, when you go talk to somebody about the life that God has shown you. Amen? Are you inspired? By the inspired word of God? God help you if you're inspired by me because that ain't going to work. <laughs> in fact, the, the worse I am, the better in, in some respects. I, I, I'm going to keep you awake so you can hear the truth. But once you hear the truth, boy, let's all stand and just ask. Or you can stay seated if you need to. Miss Mary Ellen, you stay right there. <laughs> We're going to get you a therapy chair. All right? Let's all pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon his word today. Father, thank you for your word.